we're here today with uh, Rob Pine. So we're going to have a bit of a conversation with Rob, who is a local councillor um, up in Cairns, and he's also previously the state member for Cairns in the Queensland Parliament. What was dramatic about your term in the Queensland Parliament was that you resigned from the Labor Party, uh, withdrew from the Labor Party, and then you went on to champion policies such as um, the, the abortion law reform, and at the parliamentary level, you're the one that raised that. Um, as an issue, and also you're quite notable for having uh, voted uh, a number of times, one, the only, the sole member of parliament against the Adani coal mine. So those are probably issues you couldn't have taken up inside the Labor Party. Do you want to talk about, you know, why it is that you left the Labor Party and um, and, and what that meant for, for your role in, in the parliament? Yeah, I left the Labor Party over those issues and local government corruption and it was just uh, great to be able to speak up. I wanted to vote for what I was passionate about and what I believed in. So I became an independent member of parliament and some women from the Cairns community came to see me about, about abortion law reform. So I had a bill drafted to de decriminalise abortion in the state of Queensland. Now, that's a significant part because if you're a member of the Labor, Labor Party or the Liberal Party, you can't go and get a bill drafted. You can't table a bill in the parliament. Um, you have to refer it to the relevant minister or to the party organisation. So um, it's just a shame there aren't more independents and minor parties in the parliament who can do that work where a uh, member of the community can come to them and they can actually say, you've got a really good issue, I want to back you, I want to support you here, I'll draft a bill and I'll table it in the parliament or on, on your behalf. Because I think you need to have the capacity to do that to represent the people, in, in my view. But, um, yeah, so there certainly um, the nature of the is issue ensured that after tabling the bill, it got a lot of um, attention and it was important important in moving it forward. And, um, of course, later on down the track, it reached a stage where um, it was coming to Parliament for a vote and it became apparent to me that um, a significant number of the Labor MPs were going to say, yes, we believe in the cause, but we think this is not the right bill. We don't. And, and governments do that all the time. They'll vote against an opposition bill and then put their own bill in the same terms. So, so that's uh, governments want their legislation passed. They don't want anyone else's legislation passed. So it was pretty clear to me that um, it wouldn't get passed. And the lucky thing for me was the Labor Party didn't want to spend a whole session debating it and why they weren't supporting it because that was going to upset some of their members and would create a lot of problems, not to mention cost them a sitting week. So they came to me, the um, Deputy Premier at the time, Jackie Trad and the Attorney General, and said, look, we'll agree to embark on abortion law reform if we're re-elected, if you withdraw your bill. And I said, well, that's fine, you're saying that to me now. People say things to me all the time. Uh, they don't do them. Will you do a media interview? And they did a media interview where they publicly committed to re referring the issue of um, abortion law reform to, to the Law Reform Commission and then actually introducing legislation to the Parliament. So once they'd made that public uh, commitment. I was confident that uh, it would ensure they would keep honour that if they were re-elected, which they were. I must admit, though, you're much more charitable on the Labor Party than I would be, because I think they were quite cynical in the in the in, well, even the fact that you had to leave the Labor Party in order to get the issue put up. I mean, like this has been Labor Party policy for 20 years, and they never acted on it. And um, then when it, when a bill did become before the Parliament, they didn't refute, they didn't uh, support it, and then they risked. At an election where it wasn't certain that they were going to win, obviously I think we're all glad the LNP weren't uh, brought into government. But um, they they risked the potential of an election defeat um, on for that legislation. So I think I, I personally think I personally think I mean good on them for bringing doing the right thing eventually. But they were dragged kicking and screaming in my view. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, the the only other point I would make one that I probably should have raised um, it would have been a conscience vote. And while a couple of LNP members um, would have crossed the floor and did cross the floor in the end went to, uh, when it, the legislation finally happened, um, at the time I was in Parliament, um, there were at least three Labor MPs who on a conscience vote uh, would have strongly spoken against um, decriminalising abortion, and that comes from their Catholic background and faith. So, um, so that, that, that would have also been uh, embarrassing, I guess, for many of their members to see um, three of their parliamentary members speaking so strongly against what should be uh, a woman's right, you know, to do what she wants with her own body. What comments would you make about Adani? Um, well, you know, I, I, I see um, one of the organisers, uh, Ben Pennings, I think his name is, 
uh, threatened with legislation, uh, with litigation recently. And um, I just think that sec sec secondary boycotts type action they've taken, where they've um, basically said to companies that um, enter into contact contracts with Adani, well, if you do this, we're going to boycott your financial institution. We're going to boycott your organisation. I think that's been a very successful strategy. And um, it's got Scott Morrison worried. It's got Adani worried. So I, I think uh, that that's good um, for those of us uh, who are activists that they've really shown some Good, uh, some good tactics there. And, and also the support has come from around Australia as well, which has been really good to see. And um, every day, coal is more on the nose. Uh, people can see what's happening. We know what happened last summer. We've got another summer of bushfires and natural disasters. Um, support to uh, stop mines like Adani will only grow. Um, we've just got to try and get the politicians to do the uh, implement the will of the people, I guess. The other issue you raised from the time in Parliament was the issue of uh, local government corruption, uh, which is perhaps something that people outside of Queensland haven't followed very much, but is, is actually quite an important issue here. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, um, in, the, in the previous parliamentary term, we had a Premier named Campbell Newman, and he, um, like, these Westminster princi principles um, that, that our system's based on don't always apply in local government. So Campbell Newman changed it so that um, your mayor, who's basically should be the sort of legislative branch of the council with the other councillors, was allowed to have executive power as well. And I think Campbell called it the strong mayor model. And it actually gave the mayor the power to instruct the CEO and council officers below the CEO. So that really um, allowed, um, well, put some senior council officers in a position where some mayors had asked them to think, do things that were illegal. And uh, what do you do? Of course, um, some people want to keep their job, so they'll do that. And, of course, in, in the case of a former Ipswich CEO, um, he made sure he got his chunk out of the uh, illegal dealings as well. So um, the, the, the state government has reversed that. Like, it was just frustrating for me because I'd been a local councillor. I came forward and pointed this out and said there was local government corruption. We need to make these reforms. And to just have the um, Minister for Local Government at the time in the Palaszczuk government just not even discuss it. Um, yeah, I, I, it was just so frustrating. And, and, of course, I ended up leaving the party, all this corruption is discovered, and the reforms are finally made, you know. So just uh, it's been very frustrating. And uh, at that time when I was in the parliamentary party, um, you're like I was there because I'm passionate about reform. And um, to see so many Labor uh, members of parliament who seemingly only there to ingratiate themselves to ministers and try and score a portfolio. Like, to become a minister is not a good in itself. It's only what you do and, and the legislation or reforms you can make that, that are good for society. And uh, that there just didn't seem to be that, you know, that recognition there. It was all about career advance. But even Jackie Trad, who, you know, she said to me once, oh, yes, we must do some left things. And I thought, well, hey, Jackie, that's the whole reason that your faction is supposed to exist, to implement these progressive reforms. It's not just something you might get around to one day. And, uh, yeah, it's just uh, power, I guess, the human lust for power um, pushes the other important things to the side. I mean, it's not just the human lust for power, I'd, I'd argue. There's also the whole big weight and power of the big corporate influence, like vested interests, people who make money out of uh, policies that aren't in the interests of ordinary people. Yeah. Uh, did you have any experience of that? Well, I was quite shocked, actually, because I expected the LNP to be very strong in their support of the fossil fuel industry. But then, of course, the Labor Minister for Natural Resources gets up and says there's no greater supporter of the natural resources industry in the coal sector than the Palaszczuk government. And it's like, well, wow. you know, it's, uh, it's sort of, well, I don't really want to be a part of that, you know. So that's, uh, that's why I left the Labor Party. And um, it, it, it's like that they feel this need to uh, to commit to that sort of uh, existing economic, you know, natural resources, economic development, growth, and, and, and if Labor thinks if we don't sort of show we're more hairy-chested than the LNP, we're not going to be taken seriously. It's like, it's ridiculous, you know, it's crazy. There are some other issues which I think are um, having a big impact right at the moment. I mean, obviously COVID-19 is, is one. Um, in one sense, Australia has been sort of very lucky, I think probably more luck than good management um, when you compare to other countries like uh, you know, Vietnam and Cuba um, and, and even, say, New Zealand that has taken a very clear social democratic approach to 
um, to addressing this issue. Um, nevertheless, Australia has had good results up until the sort of recent outbreak again. But there's, I guess, there are issues about the the job keeper and job seeker. Do you have any comments about the, the whole, the whole COVID nineteen approach of the government? Well, I was interested to read recently um, with jo- job uh, job keeper how that's reinforced the bottom line of many of the big companies and the CEOs have collected enormous uh, bonuses, which is really off the back of taxpayer funding. So uh, it's funny we never talk about. Um, CEO bludgers, we're always happy to stigmatise people on welfare, but uh, when it's going to the big end of town, it, it just seems to quietly pass without getting any mention. And we're talking, you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, going to CEOs in, in bonuses as a direct result of the government's policies. But um, in terms of COVID, I guess there's been pluses and negatives. The obvious uh, negative has been um, the social distancing requirement, which makes it hard to uh, organise mass protests and engage in civil disobedience which is probably more needed now than ever. Um, so that's something that's been frustrating. And I'm, I'm not a great lover of the Zoom meeting, so I found that personally frustrating. But on a positive note, I think we've got people questioning existing economic me- methodology. And, and I have certainly feel um, the word socialism is getting uh, recognised and accepted more widely. Um, it used to be a no-no in politics, uh, going back to McCarthyism and that sort of time. But uh, Bernie Sanders has been um, part of the part of the real change there, and, and of course we're all disappointed, you know, uh, the outcome with Bernie's campaign, and of course Corbyn um, in the UK. But maybe they have changed the political dialogue, and certainly um, I think more and more people are feel feeling confident now to stand on a, on a socialist agenda and uh, and push that, and uh, I think that's really important. Well, I think you've been uh, more and more prominent in your socialist views recently. Do you, want to, do you want to explain why that is? What I've been trying to do is change that debate and sort of push a greater social media presence and, uh, and try and dominate um, with explaining socialist values and why we need to head down the path of democratic socialism. I've been using the social media to do that. So um, I guess I've been more louder in trying to uh, even jealousize, I guess, push, push and uh, propagandise um, a socialist agenda because I've had the time to do it and I'll be consciously making the effort to do it. It's pretty clear to me in Australian politics we need to have socialist change or else we're not going to survive the climate crisis, we're not going to survive the inequality crisis. Um, There there isn't really a decent future for people uh, in this country and in this planet unless we organise for socialist, for a socialist change. And... um, and I guess I see a socialist organisation as being a, an indispensable part of the process of of winning that socialist change. That's right. I'm also conscious there are many socialists that that uh, aren't in socialist alliance. So I'm certainly uh, at the moment with the Queensland government election coming up. I'm supporting some progressive green candidates uh, because they'll. I think we've actually got the chance of getting two or three of them into parliament. So it's important to form those wider alliances and, and networks as well. But I just find, um, you know, reading the, the policies of Socialist Alliance and, and talking to the members, that's the perfect fit for me. But um, I'm certainly um, committed to working with other left groups. I think it's been one of the failings of the left uh, that we, um, we we fight amongst ourselves when we should be focusing on that. There are always going to be areas of difference, but we, we need to focus on the areas where we are united and, and try to um, take on the common enemy more. Yep, I certainly uh, couldn't agree more with you on that one. Um do you, so I guess the other things that have happened uh, recently. I mean, you've you've been elected now onto the local onto the Cairns local government. Um, do you want to talk about that process and some of the issues that you're wanting to raise there? Um, yeah, I, um, I I ran for council in my area where I grew up, Edmonton, on the south side of Cairns. Um, it was not easy to get elected because um, what happens in Queensland, especially in regional areas, um, you'll get a mayoral candidate who'll run a team. So we had a. Um, a conservative team run that was quite successful. So the mayor, I think, ended up getting almost 70% of the vote. So that always flows on to their divisional candidates. So I was actually uh, fortunate to get over the line. So um, there's uh, a conservative mayor, eight conservative councillors, and myself was the only progressive on council. So um, it was good to have a win against the odds, but, um, gee, it would have been good to uh, to get more supporters there. And that's, that's a bit of what I'm trying to do uh, with my social media advocacy and that sort of stuff is to create the environment 
where I can make that space for other young progressive people to come forward and, um, and sort of help mentor and, and assist them wherever I can. That's really important to me. Is there anything else you wanted to do you wanted to say before we finish up? Um, no, I'd just like to say that, you know, I've, I've also, um, I don't know if it's going to pay more attention, but I've also got a positive feeling uh, about social science over recent times. There seems to be a real hum about the place and, um, and growing support. So um, I think it's important we support our own organisation and hopefully uh, I think it is important to grow the branches and, um, and hopefully we can do that and have a real impact. And, of course, it's not all about electoral politics. It's about um, campaigns and uh, and. And, and bringing the community with us. But electoral politics is still important. So I think it'd be great if uh, there were people on the ballot. Because, you know, the last council election here in Cairns, uh, a lot of people had two candidates to vote for, both of whom were conservative. So to, to not have anyone on the ballot paper who, um, who shares your values uh, can be quite disillusioning and frustrating. So it'd be great if we could build our organisation to uh, at least offer an alternative and... Uh, in some cases, work with other progressives to uh, defeat conservatives. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rob, for joining us. And thanks, everyone, for for watching this on video, though people that are watching on video. And uh, I guess one thing I should also just mention, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter because that's the, one of the important ways that we actually get to uh, to survive in this uh, in this organisation. Of course, we want to build a strong and active and, and, and more vibrant left, and, uh, and Green Left is an important part of that process as well. Thank you.